Greetings to viewers and welcome to this virtual presentation on patterns and practices to minimize provider lock-ins with serverless. This has been an extraordinary year and I want to begin with my profound thanks to the organizers of this conference. Uh, it wouldn't have really been easy, so heartfelt thanks for all the hard work here. When I submitted this abstract for this talk back in February 2020, none of us could have imagined how the rest of the year would unfold. In that same vein, none of us could have imagined the amazing progress that has been happening in the world of serverless. Particularly, there is a cloud native computing foundation that is you know, associated with the Linux Foundation. Uh, there is a working group that has curated so much about events and functions. My goal in this talk is to share the work of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation Working Group and acquaint you with the emerging trends, standards, patterns, and practices that could be helpful. So let's dive in. It can be a bit confusing uh, to use the word serverless because clearly there are servers being managed somewhere by somebody, but somehow its significance to the architecture is a bit diminished in the current scheme of things. It's better to think of events, event sources, and how they are invoking functions synchronously or asynchronously through an enabling platform, which in turn manages the many prerequisites uh, you know, such as identity, uh, you know, the data and the access, you know, to the various functions in the back end, right? Uh, we have actually seen uh, papers written about, you know, motivating the serverless architecture to think about the binding of, you know, function as a service, which in turn, you know, ties to a back end as a service construct, right? I wanted to, you know, talk about what are all the choices that you have to think about in order to make sure that you minimize the lock-in that you may otherwise suffer from a vendor? Clearly, the platform that you choose, you have to carefully think about that. How do you go about developing the events? Where do they originate from? Whether they come from a programmer's ID or a service or an IoT device? How exactly do you bind that to a, an endpoint and how do you really manage the ongoing life cycle of all of these changes is the crux of this talk, okay? I wanted to take a moment to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Murli Kondinia. I work with a very large financial institution uh, focusing primarily around enterprise platforms. Uh, in a, I do a lot of cloud native work uh, on the CICD middleware and SRE, but my fundamental passion is around developer productivity, developing patterns and practices, helping developers make the right choices. So uh, they are by default the easy choice. So let's dive in, right? Um, if you think about serverless, it might really be helpful to start with a set of technical use cases, right? Um, serverless architectures or you know, events or functions, depending on how we think about it, they are nothing but loosely coupled asynchronous in a concurrent parallelizable systems. They have the means to scale up and down with unpredictable workloads. Uh, you know, they obviously are stateless and short-lived. So they are highly dynamic, you know, supporting change velocity. And when you think about, you know, the classical applications that tend to benefit from it, if you're really sending a lot of triggers and doing a lot of analytics, you're doing some stream processing or doing ETL, uh, or even CICD for that matter, these are all prime candidates, you know, for you to consider the event-driven architecture with a function as a service backend, right? So let's also talk a little bit about the business use cases because we all work for enterprises uh, in some form or shape. So when you think about the integrated, you know, account view of how end users are really interacting with the platform, they are, you know, traversing multiple, you know, uh, uh, services that are exposed to the web. And these you know, transactions that you are really supporting with end users have to be managed seamlessly across a multitude of devices and channels. 
you really need to have a 360 degree view and a real time understanding of what is really going on with the customer so you can really provide a unified experience. Now, think about all the things that you've really seen in the world of Uber, in the world of Airbnb and so on, where disruption is happening uh, without you having to commit a whole lot of capital uh, to build all of these enterprise services. You typically have uh, you know, the means to federate many of these services and you can you know, appreciate the loosely coupled nature of how you're really integrating all these things to create value for end users. Depending on whether you're working for a bank or for any services sector, you can appreciate that you're going to reuse services available in the world outside and create additional value for the end user. So now with that background, uh, what exactly are the choices for you, right? I mean, typically when you look at the options for you to deploy serverless architecture systems, you either have the option of deploying the platform in your premises, what we call as on-prem, or you could choose to deploy your systems on the public cloud. Now, I wanted to quickly share the major installable platforms that are installable on-prem, as well as the major providers in the public cloud who offer this as a service. It pretty much comes down to, you know, amongst the installable platforms, it's a matter of you know what flavor of Kubernetes that you really install this on, but predominantly you know the uh, yeah, options you know uh, vary from choosing Knative, which is from the uh, Google community, which is an open source platform, and it basically you know deploys on to Kubernetes, and you can actually take all of the other you know products that are listed here you can also deploy them either on Kubernetes or OpenShift. So the conversation predominantly is on the pros and cons of how these installable platforms are easy to operate and run your business on, and how you could possibly take those very same options and work with the cloud providers so they in turn can actually be deployed on the cloud so you really have the flexibility to you know, manage the whole life cycle of how you go about developing it, right? We'll dive into that in a moment. So what I wanted to share, as I said early on, is the working group that has been uh, busy within the Cloud Native Com Computing Foundation, which has been focusing on getting all of these communities that have been hard at work, developing tools and security capabilities, frameworks, hosted platforms and installable platforms, and they have nicely curated this into a taxonomy. And I wanted to share this graphic because this might really be useful because what I showed in the earlier slide was a small sampling of the you know, major tools, but there is a thriving ecosystem of uh, you know, vendors who are really creating amazing innovation. Some of these are open source, some of them are not but you can clearly leverage the good work of this working group to uh, see what the community is up to and how many of them are collaborating with the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So when you think about functions and you know, the services, uh, I made a brief reference to the various personas, right? You have a, a developer persona who is really focused on developing the functions, right? They are focused on identifying the events, identifying the functions. They are developing small units of code. When you really talk to the provider side, these are you know, individuals, you can think of them as operators. They are building APIs and subsets of functionality, and they make sure that those functionalities automatically scale, they go up and down, they have a very efficient cost model, and they don't really charge you when it is when those resources are idle. So when you think about events and functions, it is about these two personas focusing on the business logic leading to economic transactions, and they want to have the optimal combination of speed with stability, right? The developer 
rapidly iterates on the function, integrates with their CI process, and they want to be able to test locally. That is a very key point. When we identify patterns, we will touch upon that. And they want to be able to upload their functions to server platform. And the provider, likewise, wants to extract the runtime. They want to optimize on the middleware, and they want to do the metering and monitoring so we get the best of both worlds, right? So when it comes to evaluating platforms, these are all the features that one really needs to keep in mind uh, in terms of their selection choices. First and foremost, the business model, right? Are your applications really open to this loose federation that I alluded to before? Or are you really going to be stifled in terms of not being able to federate and therefore you really need to have them coexisting within your same enterprise? The second part is the technical suitability. What programming languages do you develop on? What are all the runtimes that are important? What are all the libraries that are you going to be dependent on? How do you want to do versioning? What are all the frameworks that your team is comfortable with? What is your development style and deployment workflow look like? How portable do you want your implementation to be? I'm just really giving a sampling of the you know, suitability attributes that you want to ev evaluate because when you choose a platform or a cloud provider, they really have a significant bearing. And then on the operational control, regardless of whether you are deploying it on-prem or on the cloud, these are all the attributes that you need to be thinking about. What does your environment really look like? Do you really have the means to make sure that in a multi-tenancy model, you can have the resources dedicated for your you know, consumption model so that you are not really getting penalized for your co-tenant you know, consuming a lot of resources? How do you really make sure that you don't suffer any kind of interruption when there are updates to the data center or you know, you're really dealing with some resiliency issues or in having some scalability challenges, what kind of a control do you have so that your business application is not adversely affected by the you know, happenings within the cloud provider space? Now, regardless of whether you deploy this on-prem or on the cloud, these are all things that you really need to keep in mind because you want to make sure that the end users are not adversely impacted by these invariants. Okay, so let's take a, talk about the life cycle of how functions you know, come into being again. I'm generously attributing all of this credit to the good work of the Cloud Native Compute Foundation, with where they have documented you know, the whole life cycle of how a function comes into being. You start with a specification, and you start developing the code no differently than any other enterprise application, but you essentially make sure that you do the build, you do the necessary test, and then you create the artifact that you want to deploy. In this case, there are small units of code that are called functions. They basically get deployed, and once they're deployed onto your platform, you want to be able to monitor and be able to scale it. But the key thing here is, rather than really do it you know, based on the uh, idiosyncrasies of the cloud, cloud provider, what the foundation has done is they have created very clear steps in terms of defining the various life cycle. Create, publish, you know, updating the label, execute, the event source association, et cetera, et cetera. You get a feel as to how the whole life cycle follows the traditional software development model so that when you are really developing functions, it benefits from the same structured thinking in terms of the life cycle. That is really important to keep in mind and not really be completely locked in to how the provider treats the life cycle activities. The next thing here is, in reality, as you develop your functions and they keep iterating, they will keep evolving. So when you start with uh, you know, at the very beginning, you will start by creating a function. Once you publish it, you will rapidly iterate. You will want to create the next version of the function, and you want to be able to do this in a thoughtful way so that uh, you can really learn from all the, you know, iterations that you've taken in the past. So, you know, subsequent versions may choose to go back to a prior version. You want to be able to do that and uh, keep track of the history of how uh, 
these functions came into being, so you really have the means to assemble them in a, the right way. The other pattern, again, that has been published by the Cloud Native Com Compute Foundation is the various patterns of computing, right? When you think about the synchronous model where the web uh, is generating a call into a gateway, which in turn replicates that request to one or more functions, and then the you know, messaging model is a message arrives asynchronously into some sort of an exchange, and it gets queued up, and then in the queue in turn gets drained into one or more functions. We have seen these patterns in the enterprise computing space. They will apply to the serverless model as well. And then the streaming model, where whether through you know Kinesis or you know one of those similar technologies messages basically get routed into one or more partitions. They, in turn, really get picked up by one or more functions. They drain all of these partitions and finish the backend part of the computing. And then the in a third part is the uh, uh, notion around uh, a master list of you know tasks that comes into a priority queue. The, uh, the master dispatches the uh, task to one or more of these workers who, in turn, uh, execute on those functions and then return the logic back into functions. There have been a number of patterns that have been published building upon these basic premises, and I'll share the references in just about a minute. But one of the things that I wanted to say, which is really important, again, this is work that's been done by the Cloud Native Foundation, is when you think about defining an event or you think about defining a function, the metadata associated to that event and the function is really important. So when you think about an event, you want to say what kind of a you know uh, an event class it is, what type it is, what is the version of the event, what is the identifier of the event, what are the sources, what is the identity, etc. As you can imagine, this is really important because if you are using any kind of a framework that takes the event and binds it to the corresponding function that is going to be executing to that request, you really need to have the means to bind the two together, right? So obviously, the event will really be tied to the source. The function will really be tied to the, you know, the function as a service model. And when you are developing a framework, you want to be able to say, how did you really associate which event to which function, and having all of this data and metadata is going to be important because you are now dictating the behavior of these functions uh, based on things that might really be happening. So as you can see in the various definitions of the function, it in turn tells you, you know, who is the function handler, right? So when the event arrives, the function handler is the one that is you know, processing the event and routing it to the appropriate function. It in turn is going to have a bearing on what runtime the language you know, you know, is dependent on, what code and dependencies does it depend on, the environment, the runtime behavior, et cetera. As you can imagine, when you want to externalize the behavior of all these functions, having this in an, a well-defined attribute class is going to be very helpful because it really allows the developer and the operator to bind these two constructs together. Okay, so now we've talked about the basics of how the events and the functions come together. The question that begs to be answered is, how exactly are we orchestrating the functions at the back end? Because as you can imagine, a simple event could trigger one in one function, or it could really you know, trigger a combination of you know multiple functions, right? An event could basically be executing multiple functions in sequence, or it could do it in parallel. Both are perfectly valid, right? So you can also see the daisy chaining effect where the result of a function could in turn trigger another function, and you really need to be able to manage the daisy chaining at the back end so you can really manage all of those functions and events uh, one after the other. And uh, again, uh, 
the URL that I list here below pieces out the many patterns that have been documented uh, that address the uh, finer grain details about how to build sophisticated enterprise applications that can really benefit from all of that thinking there. Uh, the key takeaway from this slide is if you basically have you know n events and you have m functions you clearly have the cardinality of like n to m and you want the programming model to help you bind the two together okay now the key here is that you know if you look at the many providers they all provide toolkits that will help development teams go about developing and deploying to this framework. Um, what I'm showing in this chart is the various cloud providers who in turn have really been partnering with this uh, company called Serverless. They have both an open source framework as well as a commercial framework that allows you to abstract away all of the idiosyncrasies of the cloud provider. So when you program on serverless, you in turn are assured that you can deploy to one of the many you know, cloud providers that they have already worked a lot with. So for example, if you are currently on AWS, you could choose to use the AWS framework, which is available. It's called a serverless application model. Or you could choose the serverless framework available from this company, Serverless. What they have essentially done is they have taken the sequence of activities that you would have to do interacting with AWS and codified this into the framework. So what you essentially get is if you are developing applications or products that are going to be deployed to multiple cloud, for example, that is a perfectly valid business model. What this really gives you is the ease of development because once you've trained your developers to use the serverless framework, that in turn abstracts away all the complexity associated to the cloud provider. Now, I would love to see more of these because uh, that is definitely good for productivity. Um, there are pros and cons of this. now. When you really have a foundation like Cloud Native Compute Foundation taking all of the foundational architectural attributes and addressing them so that you know you can really build upon it, we would love to see frameworks like serverless frameworks support Cloud Native Computing Foundation's work so we can benefit from that standardization. So there is a another implementation that I'm somewhat biased towards, which is the model called Knative. Right? Knative is the serverless implementation from Kubernetes community. So what you see here is the various personas interacting with Knative and Kubernetes. The reason I you know, tend to favor this is all of this is open source. And uh, Kubernetes is widely accepted, if not becoming the standard, you know, for all of the cloud orchestration. So what this basically shows is if you are dealing with the developer persona who wants to build and deploy, they can develop all of those capabilities using standardized APIs, right? And Knative has the means to build and deploy your functions onto the Kubernetes framework. So you can either uh, you know, leverage an existing application that might be deployed as a container, or you, know, you can choose to do this like the you know, functions that you see from uh, the other non-Kubernetes implementations. What this really gives you is the best of both worlds. You have the operators who really take care of all of the deployment and the management. So there are two constructs called eventing and serving. The serving basically takes care of all the aspects of exposing the functions to your end users at the top. And the eventing uh, component takes care of all of the plumbing that you would need to do with all of the providers, all the sources of events. 
So it's a pretty extensible framework that brings the developer persona, the operator persona, the end user persona, as well as the contributions from the community at large that is continuously developing and improvising on top of this framework uh, by building everything on top of an open source platform. Now, the advantage of such a framework here is it really gives you tremendous flexibility to have this deployed on-prem or on the cloud, or for the matter, any cloud vendor, because every cloud provider is supporting Kubernetes. So by having your application's runtime basically be mapping to Kubernetes, you benefit from you know, the support of every cloud provider who is committed to Kubernetes. So it gives you extensive portability that you all want. So um, I would love to say that this is a thriving space that you can see a lot more innovation. Just as I like the K-native implementation, you can also see uh, implementations from you know, frameworks like Spring, which has developed Spring Cloud functions, which can actually be built and deployed onto Kubernetes as well. So uh, whether you are you know, a Java shop or a Node.js shop or you know, doing things with Python, there is extensive support available uh, to develop and deploy your events and you know, function as a service onto this platform uh, by working closely with a standard group like Cloud Native Compute Foundation. I would really expect to see the community standardize on these technologies in the coming months um, to come. So with that, I'd like to thank you for listening and uh, love to take any questions.